Basically every Unix-like system out there already has a calculator installed on it called BC. And like with something like Orc, BC isn't just a simple CLI tool. You can obviously use it for that simple functionality, but it's also its own entire programming language as well, and that's going to be the topic for today. So what we're going to be doing is breaking down this file right here, which is the definition of the exponential function inside of BC. So by the end of this video, you should be able to understand all of the syntax that exists inside of this file. Before we get into anything else, you can just go and run the BC interpreter directly and use it like you would with any other sort of interpreted language, so something like, say, Python. So you can just go and test commands in this environment and basically just use it as a calculator. So we could do something like, say, 10 times by 4, that will output the answer. We could do, say, 100 modulo 7, that will output 2, so on and so forth. And we're going to be using this heavily throughout this video just because it's a good place to test stuff, but some things we will be putting into their own separate files. When it comes to incrementing a number, you have to go and assign it to a variable first. So the way that we do a variable is very simple. Let's say we want to call the variable a, and we're going to set this variable to be, let's say, 10. Now, because this is just a calculator, you don't need to worry about typing because there's really only one type. There are technically other types. Strings do exist in some form, and so do Boolean values. But Boolean values just get treated as a 1 or a 0, and strings are only barely handled in the POSIX version. If you want to make use of strings properly, you're going to have to use some of the GNU extensions, which I will show you later. Now, one of the GNU extensions that does make sense to mention now is having variable and function names that are longer than one character. So if you want to work with the POSIX version, you have to use either A, B, C, D, so on and so forth. So you might run out of variables at some point, and you might have to start overlapping stuff if you have a really complex script. So the way that we go and increment this is either a plus plus on the left hand side, or a plus plus on the right hand side. Now these actually do have very different meanings and they should be kept in mind. So if you have the plus plus on the left hand side, it's going to increment the value by one and then use it in the expression. So if I had this in say a, I don't know, a if statement and I was comparing the a value to the b value, it would increment it first and then compare it. Now if I have the a on the other side, what it's going to do is use the value that it's set to in the expression and then increment it. So in that case, I would be comparing A to B and then after it's compared it, it would then go and add the value. So let's just go and run it like this and see what it looks like if we output it in BC. So if we just want to run BC with a script, as you saw before, we just pass the name of the script into it and there we go, our value of A is now 11. If you want to assign an expression to a variable, what we do is we put the expression inside of brackets. So let's say we wanted to set A to be, I don't know, 10 times by 4. And if we go and just output A here, and we go and run this over in here. So if we want to quit this, we just run the quit command, run BC test. As we can see, the value of A is now 40. There are three conditionals that exist in this language. We have if, while, and for. Now, in the case of if, the else statement is actually a GNU extension. So if you want to use that, then you have to be happy using the GNU extensions. So if we go back over to the exponential file, as we can see, this is what a while loop looks like. It's a very standard look for a while loop. So while, and then inside of brackets, the expression we want to test against. So in this case, it's x greater than one. And then inside of curly braces, you have whatever you want to run inside of the while loop. Now, you don't actually have to have these on separate lines. You can go and actually put everything Thing that's in this block on the same line and it is going to have the exact same meaning and the way that you can say these are separate things to run is you end the pseudo line with a semicolon so like you would with say c where you can actually write an entire c file on a single line as for the if statements they look exactly the same as you'd expect in any other sort of language so if and then inside of brackets whatever the expression is going to be and the exact same rules apply for curly braces as well. Now, as for the for loops, these are also as you would expect them to be. So I'm going to delete all of this for now. So we have for, and then whatever our incrementation variable is going to start at, semicolon, and then the expression to use to test for the end of the loop. In this case, though, it's actually doing it a bit of a hacky way. So one here basically means true, meaning this loop is actually never going to end. And then after that, you increment whatever your incrementation variable is going to be. Typically, though, right here, what you'd have would be something like i less than 10 or something like that. You typically wouldn't have just a true right in that block. 
You also have access to a break statement. So break is basically used to break out of a loop if some sort of condition was met. So we could say if i equals equals 10, and then we're going to basically just run a break here. So there is also continue. So continue is to move on to the next iteration of the loop without escaping it. However, continue is also a GNU extension. I know that Python uses different operators for this, but you can also go and include multiple conditions inside of your conditional. So if you want to do an and, that's going to be done with two ampersand. So ampersand, ampersand, and let's say x less than 10. So this will only run if both of these conditions right here are true. You also have access to an or, and that's done with two pipes. So let's say or, I don't know, c greater than 10, things like this. So in this case, Either this is true, or this is true, or both of them are true. And you can negate an expression as well. Now, this is a bad example for this because you can always just use the less than sign instead of the greater than sign. But let's say that we wanted the left-hand side to be true or the right-hand side to be false. So this right here is going to say, if this part is true, it's actually false. If it's false, it's actually true. So all of these operators behave inside of a precedence table, so that is the order that they get executed if they exist inside of the same expression. Now, the thing at the top of the precedence table are the expression brackets themselves, so my suggestion is never rely on precedence tables because you're going to make a mistake. If you need to be 100% sure about the way that your expression is being interpreted, stick it in a separate set of expression brackets like you would do in any other sort of maths formula. Now onto the standard library function. So three of them exist inside of the POSIX version and there's one extra one inside of the GNU extension and the GNU extension basically lets you do user input and that function is called read. So the first one that we have is called length and length is basically going to tell you the number of significant digits in the value that you pass into it. So in this case, let's pass in the variable A and as we're going to see, there are basically two significant digits in this value, but it's technically not significant digits. It's actually just the length of the value because significant digits are basically the numbers in the value that actually serve a purpose. So if we were to say include a bunch of zeros after this 10, this doesn't actually provide any value to the number. So technically this still has two significant digits, but as we're going to see, it just tells us the length of the actual number, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but the man page is wrong about how it describes the function. The scale function is used to tell you the number of digits after the decimal point. So in this case, because we have 10 and then 15 numbers after it, it's going to tell us the value of this is going to be 15. And as we will see, rerun this BC test, the value of that is 15. And the last one that we have is SQRT, which is for square root. And I don't think I need to explain how a square root actually works. So if we run that again, there you go. But if we run BC with the dash L argument, we also have access to the math library as well. So in that library, we have S, which is for sine, C for cosine, A, which is arctangent, and all of those take in radian values, L for natural log, E for exponential log, J, which is order of N of X, so in that case, you do j, n, x. Now, defining a function is very simple. So what we do is we use the define command and then give it a name. So because we're just working with the POSIX version, the name has to be a single character. And then inside of brackets, the variables you want to pass in. So in this case, there's just one being passed in. And then after that, include curly braces. And from there, you can write it like any other sort of function. Now, there is something interesting about this. And this is the auto list. Now, for whatever reason, they decided to do local variables in a really weird way. So if you want to define a local variable, they all have to be defined at the top of the function and they all have to be inside of this auto list. I don't know why it's like this, but that's just a design decision that was chosen. If you're working with the GNU extensions, you can make a function that doesn't return a value. So the way we do that is define this function as a void function. However, the POSIX version doesn't actually have this available. So every single function in the POSIX version has to return a value. The way that we do that is with the return statement. So there's two ways this can work. You can either return an expression or return a value. So in this case, as we can see, inside of brackets, everything that's an expression in inside of the POSIX version has to be inside of brackets. We can say, okay, we want to return V divided by one. I have no idea why it's doing it like that. I'm sure there's a mathematical reason for it. If you just want to return a single value though, you can just do return and let's say we want to return V and that's how we do that. 
we also have three special variables that control the functionality of BC and one of them are actually being used in this script right here. So scale is one of those special variables. If you're just working with the POSIX version, generally you can tell it's a special variable because the name is longer than the rest of your other names. So scale is going to define how some functions work with the length of a number. Then we also have I base and O base. So that is the input and output base value. So by default, most of the time you're going to be working with base 10, but if you want to work with binary, you can set it to base 2, and I believe you can set it all the way up to base 36. If you're working with a GNU implementation of BC, and you want to make sure you're working with the POSIX version, we can go and run BC with the dash W option, and that will warn us about when we're using extensions, and if we run it with the dash S option, it will only execute things that are POSIX compliant. One extra thing I didn't mention that's also a GNU extension is the print statement. So this is why I say that strings are only barely supported. In the POSIX version, they just get interpreted as zero or one values. But in the GNU version, you can do things like say print, uh, let's say print hello world, and that prints out that value. If you have any extra confusion, I really recommend reading the man page because the man page does an absolutely exceptional job breaking down basically everything that's possible in this language and it tells you all the options, things like that. Basically, it does what a man page does, but it's written really well and goes over every single type of expression you can do and every single operator and how they work and things like that. So I recommend checking this out, especially if you are working with the GNU implementation, because if you are, it will tell you everything that's an extension. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. Maybe at some point I'll do a video like this on Orc, but if I do that, it's going to have to be across multiple videos because Orc is an absolutely massive language and it would probably take me multiple hours to do that. So I think that's pretty much everything for me. But before I go, I would like to thank my supporters. So a special thank you to Chris, Joachim, Donald Corbinian, Andrew Craig, Nathan, Montezar, Chico Bento, Joseph Pitidi, Ro, Tony, Brennan, John, Marek McKell, Nate Dog, Nephite, Poe, Tease, and Zilver. If you want to go on support my work, the links down below to my Patreon, subscribe, star, leave, pay, all of that sort of stuff. I've got my podcast, Tech Over Tea, available basically anywhere. And this channel is available on Odyssey, Library, and BitChute. If you want to watch on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.